You know, for the planet, I'm optimistic. It's been here for four billion years, and I'm sure it'll be here for another four billion years. And I, uh, it doesn't need me to worry about it. It will take care of itself. Our species has been here for in a vicinity of 300,000 years. I'm optimistic for our species. Uh, we have some big uh, problems coming up. As Johan knows, climate is going to produce some very, very significant discontinuities. But actually, our species has uh, survived on this planet under conditions much worse than the ones we're uh, thinking about. Uh, you know, 10, 12,000 years ago, the sea was 120 feet lower than it is now. And we, we came through that period. So I'm, for our species, I'm fine. For our civilization, this particular, especially Western, white, Northern, energy intensive civilization, there I'm pessimistic or at least realistic. It isn't going to uh, survive very long. It definitely will change. But what do you expect? I mean, uh, even in recorded history, we've seen a large number of great empires come and go. And we hardly could imagine that this one isn't going to be subject somehow to the historical norms. The Club of Rome has learned important lessons over the last 50 years, that humanity is interconnected and interdependent as part of the web of life and that science alone is not enough to mobilize people for transformative actions. Today is a bittersweet celebration for all of us. Some of us are very acutely aware of the war that is on our doorstep, those of us that are living in Europe, but there are many other conflicts across the globe. All of these for us are rooted in systemic failures that must now be addressed collectively. And this collective need of the human family and all species is something that was started in the reflections of the limits to growth, but has truly been the core of the thinking of the Club of Rome since. If we really measure what matters, and if we really decide that happiness and well being is what matters to us, then we can start steering our policies, our economic priorities towards creating that. And there are plenty of examples. Um, one of our colleagues, um, Kate Raworth, speaks about donut economics, which is being taken up even at the city level in many places around the world. Um, other countries in the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, other government leaders are choosing to measure other things besides GDP growth in order to steer policies and priorities. In Bhutan, we focused on measuring nine domains. We have grown up with the limits to growth volume. I have to say now, thinking about it, that maybe we didn't grow up enough with it. <laughs> that we did not really, any of us, fully understand and cooperate, not just how prescient this was, but how important and how fundamental it would have been for us to make those changes five decades ago, or to even start making them. So the question is, why haven't we taken action more quickly than this? What's been holding us back? Uh, you know, we've recognized these problems for decades now, and we've recognized and we've known the solutions really for, for decades as well. Um, I think one of the ways of looking at that is that it, it's, uh, it's best seen as an addiction, that there are a lot of positive short-term reinforcements that keep us behaving in the ways that we all know are, are not leading to a better world. Uh, so <clears throat> the question becomes, you know, what's what's the appropriate therapy uh, for this addiction that we're that we're in? Um, and it's been shown, you know, with individuals um, that you know, uh, confronting addicts uh, with their problem more and more directly is not necessarily the most productive way to change behavior. It's often counterproductive. Uh, so uh, we've looked at, you know, what sort of uh, therapies do work at the individual scale, and can those be sort of scaled up to the societal scale? And, you know, the, the uh, one therapy that seems to work quite well is something called motivational interviewing, which instead of confronting addicts with their problem, um, engages them in a discussion of their life goals. You know, what kind of life do they want to achieve? And once that's been established, then that can motivate the change to achieve that, that life goal. So how do you communicate with skeptics? Well, the way to communicate with skeptics is not to talk about saving the planet. As Dennis said, it, it, she will take care of herself. 
The key is humanity. And the good thing is that sustainability gives a better, more modern outcome for humanity and more peace and more security and more equity. And that narrative we have completely underestimated and not not cherished and developed properly. And I know that you, Sandrine, are passionate about that. Our key fear at the Club of Rome is that short-term decision-making and knee-jerk reactions do not enable us to put in place the resilience that's necessary, the shifts and the new paradigm thinking that we need at this time of real transformation to one, hit our 1.5 degrees, but also to ensure when we see so many people that are below the poverty line, when we see so much inequality, that we actually do develop the systems that we need that will protect people and that will enable us to live soundly within our planetary boundaries. I think is really important as we think about what next, how do we, how do we reorient towards something that's more whole and more life-giving. I think about the, the movements towards well-being economies which you talk about a little bit in the book, Limits and Beyond, is a way of trying to bring into our consciousness the other aspects of life beyond economic or GDP growth that give meaning. And many of them are the intangible things, the, the, the spaces between people, uh, things like time, time use as being important, closeness of communities, appreciating uh, um, appreciating uh, closeness and, and connection. These are things that are important to our sense of well-being, but are not really thought of as a part of economic development. The message of the book, which was a complex message, it said many things this book. It was not a simple um, thing like it was understood, we ran out of oil, we ran out of metals, we ran out of this, we die because of the or climate change, it was a nuanced message. It was a complex way of facing humankind's problems. And that was the intuition, one of the main intuitions of the developers of this method at the basis of the study, which is system dynamics. And the focus on well-being is critical. So at the end of the day, what's our global goal? What are we trying to achieve? Is the goal to make more money? Why do we need growth? Growth of, growth of what, right? So let's say we say, yes, growth is important. People will say growth is important because it helps us create a better economy, which gives jobs, which sustains people. Totally agree. There needs to be jobs, but aren't jobs and maintaining that well-being and maintaining that good sort of life isn't that the goal? So isn't growth or that money just a path towards a certain goal? And I think it's important not to confuse what the goal is versus an important part potentially of that goal. If I had to think back on it now, or if I have to think for the future, which is really what, as you've mentioned, we're trying to do in the Earth for All uh, document as well, is that one of the central messages there which perhaps didn't get as much importance as we should have given it, is reducing inequality. Yes, equity is mentioned, it's very important, and it's identified there that you need to have an equitable strategy. But I think now we have come to the point where we cannot confront any of these dramatic changes uh, without confronting inequality in assets, in control over resources, and in incomes, and how they are distributed. The GDP measures neither our wit nor our courage, nor, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our passion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short except that which makes life worthwhile. The IPCC, which was formed in 1988, to amass other things, take forward the issues that the club of, I mean, uh, that the limits to growth reported with. 30 years later, it's only then that they dared to acknowledge that colonialism is the root cause of the planetary emergencies that we have experiences. And that is the ongoing cause of our failure to respond adequately. 
What Aurelio Pache spoke about, and many of those members, originally the authors of The Limits to Growth, was the need to look at the human problematique, to understand the complexity of systems and how those systems interrelate, and to optimize different solutions. So I'm hopeful that today's conversation, and that's what we see it as, with MEPs here in the European Parliament, at a time when actually we've just seen a very important vote on the EU taxonomy, which has actually come back to the original need to make sure that our investment decisions are truly green. At a time when the European Parliament has said that we need a strong emissions trading scheme, that we think through how does that work within a new economic system? How can we build the systems that we need in order to truly enable us to service, as I said, people, planet, prosperity, and peace? I do believe that the Asia-Pacific region will define the 21st century sheerly because of weight of numbers. And the weight of numbers will need to reject essentially the consumption-driven economic model of uh, the neoliberal system. And to Julia's point, I think those who have will have to give up something. And that is the reality. If those who don't have and hardly have anything are to essentially have their rights uh, um, met to an uh, to extent. It is time. We've been waiting 50 years. My entire lifetime, we've known this and sat and had reasons and lobbies not to act and not to move. And it's got worse and it's yeah. got more critical. Can we please now go? Let's watch and move with the front runners and let's take inspiration and permission from them and give them a regulatory context and give them a cultural and ambition and a visionary context in which what they are doing as front runners actually becomes the norm and actually ultimately becomes quickly necessary and obvious and we do this. Is that we've got to be very deliberate in pursuing mindset change. Here's the good news. All human beings are born with the capacity for complex system thinking. We're all born with it. The only problem is that that colonial system we are talking about introduced industrialized education across the globe. And that's the block. We really need to adopt a different political culture, one which isn't based on uh, basically uh, fake compromises where some people give up now in order to uh, get more later. I think that um, one thing to always keep in mind is that no matter what you do, you are responding. So doing nothing is a response um, and Indeed. responding is a response. So this idea, what shall we do to the system um, needs to be brought back in through that that recognition that no matter what you're doing, you're in it, and and you're that there is a relationship, there is change, there is movement, there is response to response to response to response to response, and this is systemic process. Like, how do we move from being degenerative by design to regenerative by design? I think it's really important that we name where we've come from. Let's name it so we can see it, so we can see the water we swam in. It was linear degenerative industrial systems. And we must name what we want to be. We can't just talk about moving away from the... We want to become regenerative. We, we have inherited divisive systems. We want distributive systems. So I'm really into the, finding the language and the pictures to make it simple, compelling and unforgettable and irresistible mm. to be part of this transition. So that raises a question, what are the values and visions and what are the capacities that we can bring towards this change? And I think we're at an exciting time now where words like compassion and love and connectivity are being brought up even in the fields of neuroscience and that they aren't just kind of accidental qualities that some human beings have and others don't, but they can actually be cultivated and brought into the education system and even brought into the way we convene meetings and then the way that we listen to each other. And so in cultivating this kind of inner technology and bringing it together with the outer technology that is so needed at this time, we have the possibility to actually create a more sustainable, stabilized world that actually brings more well-being and happiness. 
Um, and I think that's a vision that、um, particularly young people are longing for, one that's positive and forward-looking, and really points to the highest potential that we have as human beings.